Welcome to La Course on Tet's coverage of the 2021 Tour de France. The Grand Boucle is here, and so are we, along with Peloton Magazine and our presenting sponsor, High Price, keeping this year's teams fresh day after day and keeping me fresh day after day. I've got a hypervar, and may I say my legs have never felt perkier. The Tour de France has entered its final week, the denouement of the biggest bicycle race on the planet, and there's only one man who can set the scene with his musical panache. <laughs> Uh, this week, I'd like to responsibly cock a snook at social distancing and embrace our Aerogram subscribers in the warmest of embraces. I'm OJ Borge here in a rubble-strewn post-apocalyptic version of England after it didn't come home. And on the point of that, actually, I think the Tour de France needs to learn from football just a little bit more. I am disappointed, Jeremy. I look at the cycling fans across the roads of France. I look at them. I haven't seen one of them stick a lit flare up their anus at any point during this year's Tour de France. No, and I think that's something that um, only Diddy the Devil would probably do. Can you imagine? I don't want to go there. <laughs> it would, yeah, it would make for a spectacular show. Yeah, and if you're thinking that seems slightly weird that I've said it, believe me, just Google the words anus, flair, England support, and you'll see. Uh, also, hello uh, to Peter. Hello, Peter. Hello there, OJ. And to Sophie Smith as well, who, may I say, Australia have made the right decision not letting you back in. <laughs> It was you with that flair idea, wasn't it? It was indeed. Um, just, just on the point <laughs> of, of, of sporting supporters, um, is it something an Australian supporter of any type of sport would do? What, support England? Or no, stick a flare up, up their backside. Uh, mm. No, no one that I know, no. No, uh, okay. Well, we are a special You country. guys, you English, you're on your own there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we've made it to the second rest day. That's when we're recording this. Time to reflect on what has happened and what is still to come. And the cliche that it is still a long way to Paris. And as I always say, just because it's a cliche doesn't mean it's not true. Uh, the talking points I have, we could say, cross-promoted from an article that Peter has written on La Course on Tet. Some would say it's plagiarism. I'm saying it's cross-promotion. So these are all the talking points that he's written. Not all of them. There's 10 in his latest article. I've chosen a few. That's fine, Peter, isn't it? That's fine, OJ. OK. Yeah, yeah. Let's start with his first point then, which is, can anyone stop Tajay Pogacar from winning the tour? Peter Cossins. No. OK, cool. Thank you very much. Jeremy. <laughs> OK, Pete. I mean, I mean, literally, is that it? Is it a done deal? I did say it's a long way to Paris. Uh, it isn't a done deal because thing, things can still happen. We've got, um, we've got three more stages in the mountains to come. The weather's not going to be great in the next three days or at least probably on the first two of them. So there's still the possibility of bad luck. Um, obviously, we saw on, on the Von 2 that Pogacar is still a little bit fragile, perhaps in the mountains, that maybe Jonas Vingegaard is a little bit stronger. So there's still a possibility there. But, I mean, he's got the, the biggest lead that um, any riders had um, going into the last week of the Tour since since 2000. Um, and really, you can't see him losing it. I mean, even without his team, he seems to be able to hold his own against his rivals. And he, he's going to win in Paris. Pretty, it's pretty certain, I think. It is. I mean, look, looking at it, Jeremy, I mean, in the last few mountain stages, Ineos did it. They managed to isolate him. He was on his own. And he didn't look superhuman, but he looked in control. Yeah, but I mean, what we saw was uh, a flurry of little attacks on the way into Andorra. None of which did anything to ruffle his feathers. Um, it wasn't just Ineos. It was Rigoberto Aran as well and Jonas Fingergaard. And he looks pretty impervious to it. I, I think we did see, a, it's hard to tell, on Mont Ventoux, when Vingegaard first had a go and opened a bit of a gap on him, there was a moment where you thought, oh, is he cracking? But then everybody I've spoken to in the team car said, oh, no, that was just him being smart, you know, that he didn't need to chase him. He's, he's leading by over five minutes. Why would he go after a guy who's, like, possibly going to make it on the podium? And it was half a kilometre from the top of the Von 2, so there was no need to waste energy. And he's just got, he's got so much time on everybody now that the, the battle, the real battle is for second and third place. Because cause that's it, isn't it, if we look at it, Sophie? I mean, realistically, Pogaccio had a couple of good stages. And since then, he's just been the same as everyone else because he doesn't need to do any more. Yeah, exactly. I can't see him at all. I mean, he, he could even have a nightmare every day and I still don't see him losing this tour. Uh, Jeremy and I actually spoke to Geraint Thomas at the start of stage 15 um, and we asked him about him. 
and Geraint turned around and said, Dave Brailsford, the Ineos Grenadiers team manager, had told him, had, had said, you know, uh, Tade is like bamboo. He bends, but he rarely snaps. And the kid either, I mean, <laughs> either really hasn't even opened up at this race or he has the best poker face of all time. I just, I, I, I think he's riding sort of what Jez just alluded to is a smart race as well. I asked him sometime last week, I don't even know what day it is now, but if he with his lead now, if he would consider going for another stage win in the mountains. And he virtually just said no. He's just the goal's a yellow jersey. And uh, so far, that seems to have been his plan in the mountains. I think he's home and host. Is that, is that just him being smart, Peter? Yeah, I think. I mean, if, I think this is one of the, 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 well, the many qualities he's got. He's got so many, but uh, he's just very smart on the bike. He knows, he knows when to attack. He knows when not to attack. He knows what his strengths are and when when he when he should move when he needs to rely on his teammates and you don't ever really get the sense that he's in any kind of trouble at all. He's almost it's almost seemed like he's got a Teflon coating on him. He's, I mean, he, he did crash on the opening stage, but um, I think he was sort of held up more than down on the ground for very long. Unlike pretty much all of his rivals who all hit the deck and are, are still kind of well either not here anymore or, or carrying injuries. And it just seems extraordinary. I mean, he's just got that kind of aura that, that great champions have. And you're just kind of almost inevitable that he's going to win. Mm. Here's, here's a hypothetical. Hypothetical, Jeremy. Say you got um, Ineos, Jumbo Visma um, and EF all working together. Do you think they could still beat Bogaccia, one of their riders? Uh, I even think that's questionable because... Because I'm not sure. Well, that rarely happens in cycling. I mean, we have seen, we have seen, we, we, yeah, we have seen combines in the past, but that's really been, uh, I think, when it's been much closer. Because look at it, they've got to expend an awful lot of energy to get a few seconds out of him. You know, to distance him by half a minute. We've seen that. We've all been watching the race. Imagine how much effort it's going to take to get a minute back, two minutes back. At the moment, he's the favourite for the final time trial, where it's probably take at least another minute. The closest, the best time trial, I think, is that's close to him is probably going to be Rigoberto Aran. Hasn't got the strongest team. Jumbo Visma is seriously depleted. Yesterday on stage into Andorra. On Sunday in the stage into Andorra, Vingegaard was really isolated. Um, they took a risk by putting him up front on his own um, with with the break ahead of him so that he was he was quite isolated carapaz on sunday had everybody working for him attacked and made absolutely no inroads so they would all be they'll still be talking a good game but equally they'll all be thinking okay we expend a lot of energy trying to win the race we'll lose the energy we need to safeguard our podium place when was the last time somebody had five minutes heading into the second rest day it was 2000. It was, uh, I can't remember the guy's name now, actually. It's been scratched from the record books, but I think, think you all know who it is. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I'm, and when before that? Because, I mean, these things come along. We've had some very close grand tours over the past few years, but this, this is a throwback tour, isn't it? In some ways it is, but I mean, one of the things that really absolutely knocks my socks off, if we can use that phrase, is how close it is for second and third and fourth and fifth. So you've got like five riders basically within a minute of each other, Rigoberto Aran, Vingegaard, Carapaz, Ben O'Connor, Wilco Kelderman. Then you scroll down the GC a little bit, you get to 10th place and then it's like 10 minutes behind. And then from kind of 10th place down to 20th place, it's like 40 minutes behind. I I, I, do you know, I hadn't seen this. Balkan Molimer in 21st is 47 minutes down. Yeah, but if you look, if you look too at the the time gaps between kind of tenth place, uh, which is Peo Bilbao at uh, ten minutes, well, basically eleven minutes down, Mat- Mattia Catania of De Koenig Quick Step, he's five minutes further behind Bilbao, and then in twelfth place, Aurelien Pantre of ag 2 r is six minutes further back. I mean, I can't remember at all when I've suddenly seen you know twelfth place is like. 21 minutes down on the on the yellow jersey uh, on the second rest day. Is that because Bogatia's so far ahead that people have done more and more wild attacks that haven't worked? They've been racing for stages rather than racing for positions. Is that the reason? I think there's there's I mean there's a lot of elements to it. I think one of the things that we we can't overlook is is that probably as many as 50% of the peloton crashed in the first 3 days of the race. 
and that either they either lost substantial time in those crashes or it meant they lost lost substantial time subsequent to those crashes and then on the second weekend when the race was um was in the alps the weather was absolutely atrocious so lots of people suffered in that weather a, a lot more of them crashed again because it was so wet and it's just been a, a very very attritional race that people have i think deliberately lost time in order to 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 give them a chance of winning stages to ride in for stages and really we haven't seen i mean apart from uae a little bit and ineos maybe in the last few stages we haven't really seen teams riding as a cohesive unit all that often it just seems like it's it's every rider for himself a lot of the time well, it's going to be fascinating. As we head towards Paris, it's going to be fascinating. I think we've answered the question of anyone can stop Pogacar from winning the Tour, and the answer is quite emphatically no. So let's move on to one of the second points from Peter's article, and that is what would the conditions be like on the final three mountain stages? We're in the Pyrenees, Peter, um, and they are interesting stages, aren't they? So do you want to talk us through 16, 17 and 18 of what we can expect? So so we're starting on stage 16, I mean, it looks like... Um, if you think back to the stage that Banker Mollema won, um, stage 14 into Kion, it's kind of a, 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 I wouldn't say a rerun, but it's similar to that stage. Um, the, climbs are, the climbs are harder. They go over the Col de Pau, uh, then the Col de la Cour, which is, which is quite a hard climb. Um, then the Porte d'Aspect, but on its easy side, very, very difficult descent though. I mean, people, it's notoriously difficult. Um, and then there's a little climb towards the finish, but they basically got about 30k off that last uh, off that last climb into the finish. So it looks like a good day for a break. Then the um, the stage on Wednesday is, I mean, people are saying that kind of all the hard stages are gone, but I think Wednesday stage is very hard. They they do kind of 100 kilometers before they reach the mountains, and then they do sort of reprise the short stage that we had in 2018 that started with the F1 style starting grid, a 65 kilometer stage. Then they basically reprise that going over the Perisord, the Col d'Aze, and then up the Col de Porte, which is may well be the toughest climb in the Pyrenees, certainly on the French side. And then the day after they go over the Tourmalet and finish at Lusardiden, which they've not been to since 2011. Not, 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 particularly hard climb as something finishes go but uh, again it's it's a difficult test this far into the race it, it's it's three fabulous looking stages sophie which one of those if there was going to be any movement or attacks or or anyone trying to move further up the gc where would you see it happen does it have st- does it have to start at 16 does it have to start as soon as they're back on the bikes oh, pete is the resident expert when it comes to the pyrenees <laughs> i'm currently reading his latest book um I don't really know if this point of the tour that anyone is is holding back. I expect that we're still going to see what we have in the mountains really is sort of a break uh, going up the road and and contesting the stage and then the the yellow jersey group um, doing their thing at the back. I don't think anyone will be holding back at this point of the race just because it's the third week of the tour but also because as Pete said everyone I spoke to on the second rest day is absolutely shattered (laughs) you can hear it in their voice you can hear it in their tone (laughs) you can see it on their face it's been a really difficult tour and there are some people that I spoke to Simon Clark from the Quebec team and he said he fell three times in the first three days and has been buckled since then he's just said it's survival <laughs> i don't even think he, <laughs> he's looking at a result sheet <laughs> for himself or anyone else i mean that's one of the things isn't it that you know you look at there even when we were we were in the uh, mix zone yesterday morning as sophie said waiting for garrett thomas and chatting to a few other people as well and uh, the riders come past you know one in ones and twos to go to sign on i've rarely seen so many riders banged up you know with their bandages on and, and such such big extension of bandages as well and I was thinking when was the last major crash and then there's been so many of them so many major stack ups and people are still recovering from the crash on stage one caused caused by the the infamous banner waving spectator there's this if only she'd had a flare up a bum well, everything would have been fine well exactly yeah yeah it's blown into space but then but then you know there's there's kind of like people still moaning about oh, I'm recovering from that and I mean you know, it's kind of like I think mentally as well. They 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 are really battered. You know, this year seemed to have been really grueling. I think the weather's the weather's been one of the worst weather tours I can remember. It's been raining quite a lot. Obviously, we've seen it on TV. Everybody's been watching it, and I think they're just mentally pre-run down. It's going to be hot in the Pyrenees, though, isn't it, Pete? 
It's not actually. It's, Is um, it not? I've just spoken to my wife. I'm I'm in Andorra, and she's just on, over on the other side of the Pyrenees at home, pretty pretty near to the Col de Pau. They, they go over on on stage sixteen, and she said it is absolutely lashing down there at the moment. It's it's really grim. She's she's hoping to go out and take my kids out and see the tour, and uh, they're thinking of uh, of, a, of a DNS, a, a, a do not start <laughs> for, for that expedition. So I mean, it, the forecast for tomorrow is is a little bit better for for that area. But they're supposed to be rain, and and like I said, they, they go over the Porte d'Aspect at, at the end of, towards the end of that stage, and it's got a very very difficult descent. I mean, it's well known for kind of infamous, I guess, for the unfortunate death of Cap Fabio Casatelli in 1995. But I mean, it was a climb where um, or a descent where Philippe Gilbert really sustained a bad injury a, a few years back as well. So it's got a bad reputation. It's one they're going to have to be very very cautious on tomorrow, especially if it's wet. As the Pyrenean expert, before we move on then, choose one part for me. One pass, one descent, one ascent. Where, where would you see the excitement's going to be across 16, 17 and 18? Where do you see it's going to be? It's going to be the Col de Porte on stage 17. It's, it's, it's a very, very difficult climb. I mean, when they first used it in 2018, the, 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 the leading group kind of wouldn't split, didn't say it split massively, but there were, there were significant gaps. I mean... Geraint Thomas, I think, gained a minute on Chris Froome, his teammate, and other other riders lost significant amounts of time as well. It's a very difficult climb. They, it goes up to 2,200 metres, so they're, they're kind of at altitude as well. So I think that's the one to look for. And don't forget, the day after that, it's a sprint, and then it's the big old TT, which is a repeat of the one earlier in the tour. Uh, let's move on to the next question then, and that is one which, considering they came here with, on paper, one of the strongest teams ever assembled at the Tour, full of Grand Tour winners, Ineos are looking like they might not win a stage for the first time since 2014. And Jeremy, this is almost unheard of, isn't it? Ineos not challenging for some sort of honours. It's very odd. I mean, we've all been pondering exactly what's what's happened there. Um, and if you talk to the, the team, which is quite difficult, actually, to talk to the team, um, uh, they've been quite reclusive, I think, is the nicest way, politest way of putting it. Um, this tour, it's not really clear uh, exactly what their objectives are because some people are saying, oh, well, you know, Carapaz on the podium in the top three. Gabriel Rash at the start, just in Serre, was saying that, uh, you know, the victory was still on. Um, I don't know if he was saying that at the finish in Andorra, but he was saying it in the morning as well. And Theo Kagan Hart was uh, somebody that Sophie and I spoke to this afternoon and, and he was kind of, I suppose pretty down the mouth, really. Um, he wouldn't say he'd had a miserable time, um, and he was still hoping to get. He said he was still hoping to get something out of the last week. But obviously, given that they started the tour with a, that four fa- famous four prong strategy of Carapaz, Thomas, Gegen Hart, and Richie Port, um, it's come asunder pretty and it thunder pretty soon as well. Well, you spoke to uh, to Teo Gogan Hart. I would I was going to call him the hippest rider in the peloton. Is that right? Is he the hippest rider in the peloton? He's not the happiest. Well, he's not the happiest, but he is the hippest. So let's hear from Teo Gogan Hart. Yeah, I mean, I think it wasn't like a kind of specific set aim coming into the race. So I guess it's hard to pass judgment in, in that respect. But at the same time, yeah, obviously not been at the level that I felt I was uh, coming in and, and that I still feel like I am to be honest I um, think on the first day I was like unlucky and also really lucky um, so yeah then just had kind of a week to 10 days of, of struggling with um, just small repercussions of, of those crashes really uh, well just the one crash um, and yeah just pain some, some problems with my back and stuff but yeah in the last two three days it's been um much better so I'm hoping that uh, this last phase of the race can, can try and take something from it and um, yeah of course try and uh, have a, a memorable uh, experience in, in this tour because I would say so far not been memorable it's always hard when you don't feel yourself and also when you have pain but um, at the same time you're also always constantly reminded that you know just being in the race and th- there's always someone in a worse position right so there's a lot of guys already been home for quite a while, um, which is really unfortunate. And, you know, other people who are no doubt suffering even more in, in the race. So, um, yeah, of course, it's not the position that you want to be in and that you work so hard for and, and plan towards. But 
at the same time, I think, you know, for example, yesterday was really not the the most favourable conditions and and yeah, the race didn't didn't turn out how we would have liked. But at the same time, like as a team, we we rode really well and and we tried our best to to open the race up even kind of in the face of 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 those conditions and and um yeah, of course also strong opposition. So I think you have to also reflect on those those positives to be honest um, and, and take everything a little bit in, in balance in that respect. Teo Gogenhart there speaking to Jeremy and Sophie. Um, I mean, he, he seems downbeat, very downbeat, Jeremy, doesn't he? I mean, body language wise, did he did he seem that way? He did seem very downbeat. Yeah, he did seem very downbeat. And and it was, it was, I mean, he's actually avoided talking to the press pretty much. Well, I don't know if he's actively avoided it, but it's been very difficult to get time with him. And, you know, we have this thing now at the starts where we have a mix zone, which is basically we are, we have to stand in pens, pens of nationality. Uh, and then we have to kind of hope that they stop or attract their attention or ask the team beforehand. And there's a guy with a clipboard now, who <laughs> Sophie pointed out to me, who's supposed to take, you know, your name and their name and then bring you together. But it doesn't really seem to work that way. They seem to they seem to accelerate past. It's like they swipe swipe left, definitely. You know, and so like speed dating. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to talk? Who wants to talk to me? They do. Right. Watch this, as they go. Well, here's a question. Then here's a question. Then about Ineos, uh, Sophie. Do, are they racing for stages? Do stages matter to them, or do you think? And I've heard a couple of ex pros say. I've heard David Miller say. I've heard Wiggins say it as well. Second, third on the podium doesn't really matter to Ineos. I actually asked Teo about this. Uh on the second rest day about tactics and why we've seen it with Jumbo Visma do it. Like they've got Vingegaard on top three on GC, but they've also got two, you know, they've put their riders up the road and they've got two stage wins. And I've really been scratching my head this entire tour wondering why Ineos, Ineos hasn't done the same thing. Why if, you know, they've got Carapaz now effectively is the only person that can get on the podium. And I think they're hell for leather going for that. Um, but I had intimated to, to Teo and even asked Gabrielle, like, um, you know, what's the, what's the tactic here? What's the strategy? You're looking for stages and Teo just kind of dismissed the question and said, I'm done with talking. I don't want to talk tactics. Um, <laughs> and it was funny, Gabrielle then said something about, no, we still think we can win it. And Geraint Thomas said, no, we're going for the podium. Um, I don't, yeah, I think I spoke to someone, there's an Australian writer that said the way the tour is ridden is dictated by who is winning the race. And on that logic, then today Pogacar is dictating how the race is going to be won and that is not a style that Ineos is familiar with. They came in saying expect something different uh, and I maybe they've tried that, maybe they haven't. I think they've certainly gone back to what they know works in terms of trying to get on the podium now. Um, so you think they are, they are just looking for a podium place, they're not trying to win it? I don't, I don't see how they can win it. I think the way they're racing is, is fully in support of Carapaz. Um, as opposed to, I mean, they've always sacrificed stage wins to get normally to win the tour. From what we've seen so far, I think now they're saying like a podium, a podium spot will, is wow. sort of you know uh, make a, you know the key objective. But yeah, for them, this is a team that's won how many tours? Like eight tours in. Well, they were years, the dominant team, weren't like they, that. for such a long yeah. time? Yeah, all dynasties end. They do. They do indeed. I mean. You'd be hard pressed to say the dynasty's ending. Why am I saying dynasty? Dynasty. I've started speaking like you, Sophie. <laughs> dynasty. 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 I think. I think. I think the. I think the other thing to say though is that they have not been the same team. There's two key individuals that have moved on. Well, one of them of passed oh, on, which is nuts. You know, more than moved on. That's very very tragic, and they were really affected by it. And he was he was the glue. I think he was the talismanic figure in the team car who. Even though he wasn't riding the race, he knew he knew the peloton so well, and he knew the road so well, and he knew the riders so well, and he was always upbeat. I mean, Gabriel Rash is the direct sports, net, direct sports director now is not cut from the same cloth as Nicola Portal. I'm sure he's very good at his job, but he's not got the same ebullient, irrepressible joie de vivre that Nicola Portal had. The other person who's moved on, of course, is Chris Froome, um, and he moved on par partially forced because it was crashed but then obviously moved to another team and I think there were certain kind of sounds old-fashioned but there were certain standards of attitude there were certain attitudes that Froome had and that Portal had that started to creep in a bit I mean I find it quite odd because 
A couple of things, I don't, don't want to name the names of the riders, but a couple of things that I saw, I think we all saw, that we thought were slightly, well, they wouldn't have done this on Froome's or Portal's watch. Uh, and it just feels like they're not quite as, I mean, they'll, if they listen to this, they won't like it, but it feels like they're not quite as iron-willed as they were before. What what things? What things, Jeremy, that they wouldn't have done? <clears throat> A couple of times it felt like riders were not cohesive or riding as a collective they weren't pulling for you know what what the objective was but maybe that's because the objective isn't clear i mean i think the carapaz is very clear he seems totally you know, you know this is what he's going for i think if he could win the race he'd grab it in a second he looks you know he's got that look of intent and motivation every time he's on pogachar's wheel i don't know if he, he, i don't know if he'll ever have the <clears throat> wherewithal to over overhaul him but he's not giving up Whereas it was the Von Two stage, a couple of things happened with a couple of riders that made me think: Are they taking this seriously? One, one thing, I'd, one thing I'd add to to what, what everybody said there is: there's kind of an interesting, uh, a, a longer term question. In as much as they haven't got the best rider in the sport, we all know now that's that's Tadej Pogacar, and I mean they've got the strongest team though. I mean if. Their team on paper is stronger than the UAE team. Yeah, but I mean, if you've got the strongest rider, often if you've got a very good team, which I think Pogacar has has got. I mean, people have been knocking it, but it's this has been a very very difficult race for any any team to control, and uh, I think they've done a pretty good job of it most of the time. But you, you've got to look at, at at the future and think, well, how are they how are they going to beat Pogacar in the future? I mean, well, hang on, we're we not all having really short memories here. That two years ago, Bernal was going to win a thousand Tour de France and no one was ever going to beat him. I mean, that that was that was the narrative as we came out of that Tour de France. I mean, am I forgetting that? So, and we're saying that Pogacar is the strongest rider in the sport right now at this moment on the second rest day is, but is he come twenty uh, next year? Oh, well, he has been for the last two years, and I don't think in any of his results he's ever. I need to check this, but I don't know if <laughs> he's not accustomed to finish finishing fiftieth or fortieth or maybe even. 20th. One of the things that, that, that UAE were doing very cannily is they're bringing on a lot of a lot of young riders who are, I mean, they've signed this uh, Spanish, uh, I think he's partly Colombian guy, Ayuso, in recent days, he's very, in recent months, he's very young. They're, they're building for the future and they're kind of creating a strong core of riders around, um, around Pogacar and, and kind of creating their own dynasty. And it's going to be interesting to see how Ineos react to that. I mean, obviously, they have got Bernal. They have got a very good young riders. I'm not saying that they're washed up at all. They're, they're not. But it's just going to be interesting to see how they react because Pogacar just seems to be like the preeminent Grand Tour rider at the moment. I mean, maybe Bernal, if he's in his best condition, and I still don't think this year at the, at the Giro, we really saw him in his best condition. Two years ago, when he won the Tour, he was. But... If he can get back to that that kind of form, maybe he will be able to challenge Pogacar. But um, I just think there's a big question mark over their strategy in the future. I don't think that Ineos are um, are washed up. They're definitely in transition. It feels like they've lost, you know, as I said earlier, the glue that really binds them, and they need to really really decide where the where the Carapaz. I mean. It's a British team, and they know full well. I'm sure they know full well that their brand value as a sponsor really comes from the British media and having a British winner. Now, Richard Carapaz could win the Tour, but he wouldn't, you know, it would be nothing compared to the media exposure they get if Garant Thomas won the Tour. And I think they're fully aware of that. So it feels like they're at a crossroads and they need to, you know, there's a new phase going to hopefully going to come for them where, you know, they, they can reassert themselves. But at the moment, they, they look a bit lost. He could be the, he could be the answer. I mean, we... we Tom Pickcock. Yeah, Tom Peacock could be the answer. I mean, we we've not we've not seen him in a Grand Tour yet. There are suggestions that he might well ride the Vuelta after he's ridden the Olympics this year. So, I mean, it'd be interesting to see how he's doing because if he does ride the Vuelta, he'll be up against Pogacar by all accounts. He'll probably have pretty much Roglic there. I mean, it's going to be a very strong field. Maybe maybe even Egan Bernal is going to be there. We don't know yet. So it'd be interesting to see how he goes, but. I don't know. I mean, I just, I mean, like Jeremy says, I think they are a team in transition trying to find this, this next kind of leader who can provide a focus for them. Or maybe, maybe it's a group of leaders who can, who can threaten Pogacar. Time to talk now about our presenting sponsor. I'm going to do that whilst using their product because I have one 
and it's amazing and i think it'd be a nice way to do it as i oh get my legs fresh again because i did do a session on the turbo earlier and now if you've ever wondered how the tour de france riders stay fresh and keep pushing day after day oh there's the hot spot they recover with Hyperice's top recovery tech, including the Normatec 2.0 recovery systems after every stage. Normatec technology uses dynamic, oh, there we go, compression to increase circulation to the legs, flush out muscle soreness, and helps riders revive themselves quickly. Take your endurance to the next level like a pro. Hyperice technology, including the Normatec 2.0, is available at trekbikes.com. Click the Hyperice banner on our homepage, which is pelotonmagazine.com, to claim a special Tour de France offer. Uh, and that's all the talking points we're going to do from uh, Peter's article. As I said, you can read the rest of it on the course on Tech website. The last thing that you wanted to talk about, Jeremy, was Sepp Kuss, super domestique and complete fashion icon. Now, there is the most amazing photo that I chucked in our WhatsApp group of him on a bike. I would guess he's probably a teenager. He's wearing what looks like a ski jumping suit. He's got a lovely, colourful waistcoat on to go with it. Some amazing glasses, which makes him look like one of the Thunderbirds. I mean, really... As a rider, he is idiosyncratic, he's iconic, he could be the next big GC hope, or could he? Well, that's the thing, isn't it? Because um, there's no doubt when he first, he didn't really burst onto the scene, but to me, European sensibilities, I suppose his really big moment was winning the Tour of Utah. And that was definitely when kind of World Tour teams thought, who is this kid? And he was riding for Rally Cycling. Uh, he'd been with Rally Cycling for a while. Colorado, his dad was a US national ski coach. He grew up in the mountains, kind of raced in Nordic skiing and uh, then got into mountain biking and then finally in, into road racing. So the Tour of Utah was when we saw him on TV in Europe and we realised what a gifted climber he was because he blew everybody away on the climbs in that particular race, which is all, all at altitude. Um, and then he came to, Brit to, to Europe and... And he rode a couple of stage races. He won a stage in the Vuelta, which is particularly charming because he did this thing in the last 500 metres of, of kind of high-fiving everybody. He went across to the barriers so he could high-five everybody in the crowd. And he said that was something that he'd seen at mountain bike. He'd been doing at mountain bike races. And he said that was one of the things he loved about cycling, that you know the, the fans are so close you can kind of high-five them all. And he's just got a real... Uh, openness and he's very eloquent he was going to study english literary lit, he studied english lit at a uh, university in colorado and a, a kind of intelligence and um not naivety but a just kind of openness you know that that's really charming when you when you talk to him lives in andorra now but his achilles heel is time trialing and the people i've spoken to who i've said well why wouldn't sepkus make a gc rider always point to this as being a weakness i think he's getting better um, probably needs to get better quite quickly, given the other talents he's up against. But it definitely feels like he's the kind of guy who could, you know, who could move into winning the Dauphiné. You know, something heavy on mountains, heavier on mountains than perhaps um, this tour is. You know, maybe even a Vuelta, I mean, where the steeps are really climbed. That feels like the kind of terrain he could he could really flourish in. Interesting. Interesting. Well, time will tell. And that is us done. We've run out of time. Thank you very much to Sophie. Good luck with getting back into Australia when the tour's done. Yeah. Does that mean you're here for the Vuelta? I could be here till Christmas, OJ. Oh, OK. Yeah. What which is, we which is Vuelta? <laughs> which is? <laughs> uh, thank you to Pete as well, our Pyrenean expert. Thanks, OJ. Uh, and thank you very much to uh, Jeremy Whittle, who I think sounds in a better mood than he was at the start of the podcast. What do you reckon, Jeremy? I'm just putting on. <laughs> oh if i could tell you the tweet he sent me before we started oh i can he called me a and that is us done thank you very much for listening to you we'll be back for a post-tour roundup to see who made it to paris in yellow if cavendish has managed to break Merckx's record and to see if anyone shoved a flare up their broom wagon till then there's more writing on the course on tech.com and loads of wholesome content via the peloton social channels thank you as always to our presenting sponsor hyper ice until then au revoir beer beer Vieni via di qui, niente più ti lega a questi luoghi, neanche questi fiori azzurri.